One of the advantages at studying at Maryland Carey Law is the chance to hear from and talk with and learn from brilliant faculty. Many of our students have not had the benefit, <clears throat> have not had the benefit to work with one of our most exciting professors because she's been on leave for the past few years. Well, today's your chance to understand why Professor Sherilyn Eiffel has the extraordinary and well-deserved reputation that precedes her. Our law school is fortunate enough to have on its faculty a colleague whose talents are so respected, valued, and cherished that she has been asked to lead the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, one of the most distinguished and effective rights organizations in the world. Professor Eiffel currently serves as the president and director counsel. Now, as many of you know who hear me talk, I spent the summer reading Professor Larry Gibson's excellent biography on Justice Thurgood Marshall, a legal giant who once held the same position that Professor Eiffel does today. What a legacy. And just like Justice Marshall before her, Professor Eiffel is grappling with issues that are searing, divisive, and yet absolutely central to the very meaning of democracy. In fact, they lie at the heart of any democracy here or in any other nation. Now, one of the best things about Professor Eiffel being at the NAACP is we get to have her back when she's done. She's just on leave. She's committed her professional life to those issues, to equity, civil rights, and justice for all. She began her legal career as a fellow at the American Civil Liberties Union and then moved to her legal defense fund where during five years as an assistant counsel, she litigated the landmark Voting Rights Act case, Houston Lawyers Association versus Attorney General of Texas. It's a Supreme Court, in that case, the Supreme Court held that judicial elections are covered by provision of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Those of you who follow law may know that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is currently still a major litigated issue. Professor Eiffel then joined our faculty more than 20 years ago. Through her research, teaching, and litigation, frequent media appearances, and sustained engagement with issues of race and American life, Professor Eiffel has emerged as one of our country's finest public intellectuals. It is my privilege to present Professor Sherilyn Eiffel. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Dean Tobin and, uh, and Dean Barth, and to all of you. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Hold on. Arthur tried to tell me. Hold on. There we go. Now you can hear me, right? Okay. Uh, thank you to, to Deans Tobin and Dean Barth and um, to those who organized and arranged my visit here today, of course, to Trishana Bowden. Uh, to, to you all for coming during this lunch hour. I'm sure the pizza was also an inducement. Um, but most of all, I want to thank you for so powerfully staying engaged with this moment that we're in in our country. Um, I've been following the conversations that you've been having about this issue uh, last semester and now this semester, and I'm just very proud that you are doing what I always expect this law school to do, which is to engage forthrightly and um, aggressively with the challenges that we face as a society and always to be asking ourselves the question, what should we be doing as lawyers and as law students and as social workers and as social work students to engage uh, in solutions to these powerful issues? So today, um, when, when Dean Tobin asked if I would come and, and speak, I, I didn't really want to do um, a speech because I'm back home uh, among my, <laughs> my colleagues and, and students. And one of the things I greatly value in the opportunities that I've had to go around the country speaking with uh, lawyers and law students is really the opportunity for engagement. These are incredibly difficult issues. Uh, and I learn um, a great deal from the conversations that I have with people all over the country. So what I thought I would do is talk, about, talk with you for about um, 20 minutes and then hopefully have time for questions and answers and engagement. Now, um, 
I've said that I would talk for 20 minutes, but once I get rolling, um, I, someone will need to, could you give me, give me the 15 sign and, um, and I'll try to kind of bring it, bring it together so that we really have an opportunity to talk. I think the first thing I want to um, do is kind of set out what I think are the three things that might be worthwhile for us to talk about today. Um, one is, what is it about this moment that makes it so powerful and so important? Um, secondly, what should we be doing? What is the answer in the more or less short term? And then lastly, I want to talk about what I think is a more long-term structural issue that we must engage and that certainly we are talking about at the Legal Defense Fund. Um, so first of all, you know, the name of this talk is Beyond Ferguson, and my desire at this moment is that we not get beyond Ferguson just yet. Um, I think all too often in this country we are um, so hesitant, so nervous, so afraid of engaging in difficult conversations, especially about issues of race and justice, that we are always looking to get beyond it as quickly as possible. And as a result, we have left on the table, under the table, around the table, um, a bevy of problems that continue to bedevil us over and over again. And for many of those issues, we have made precious little progress. I'm a great believer in talking and engagement. Those of you who um, read my book about the last two recorded lynchings in Maryland on the courthouse lawn know that much of that book was devoted to the idea of breaking silence um, and of having the courage to confront many of the events uh, that have happened in our past that actually account for the way we are today. The past essentially helps explain why we live the way we live, why we think the things we think, the obstacles that we face. And I think we're now at a moment this year in this country where we have no choice but to engage an issue that is not, by the way, a new issue, the issue of uh, police violence against unarmed African Americans. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about this. When I uh, was in St. Louis in September, I did a radio show. And um, I was giving a speech that night, and, I, and the public radio station asked me to come and, and talk. And in the course of that conversation, the radio host asked, you know, why are we seeing all of these killings this year? You know, this is, what, what is happening? And many of you may have asked yourself the same question. And the answer I gave him was that um, you're just seeing them, <laughs> um, but that in fact they're not new. And quite um, spontaneously, I started to tell him about my first encounter with the issue of um, police violence of, of unarmed African Americans. And, and I told him what I remembered. I said, you know, my first experience with this happened when I was 10 years old. Um, I grew up in New York in Queens, and when I was 10, I remember that there was a police killing of an African-American boy. I couldn't remember the boy's name. I always remembered that the officer's name was Shay, and I remembered that the officer said the boy had a toy gun, no gun was ever found, toy or otherwise, and I remember that the officer got off. Um, I remembered the conversations at the bus stop about it. I remembered what I think was the daily news on my parents' coffee table. I remembered adults talking about it, but it shaped me, right? Because he was 10 and I was 10. So when Tamir Rice was killed um, in Ohio, you know, the question I always ask myself is how many 12-year-olds are being shaped in the way that I was shaped um, by that killing that happened when, when I was 10? Uh, by the time I got back to my hotel room, um, you know, some of you may know I'm a big Twitter person, so you should follow me on Twitter, please. Um, someone had tweeted me, who had heard the show, and had said, I found the case that you're talking about. And he sent me um, an article about the case. And shockingly, it was as I remembered it. The officer's name was Shay. The boy's name was Clifford Glover. He had been killed with his father on a Saturday morning. Um, he was walking on New York Avenue in Queens, not far from where I lived, 
and he and his father were going um, to a junkyard where they um, retrieved scrap metal to make money. And a, a car drove up, not a, not a marked police car, and two plain clothes, what we later learned, where police officers got out and began to, with guns drawn, chase this father and boy and shot the boy and killed him. And they began to exult. We got him. Uh, and then later, when the precinct commander came and he saw the boy, he said, couldn't you tell he was a child? They thought he was a robbery suspect that they had heard about on the radio. Um, officer Shea is one of the few NYPD officers who was actually indicted uh, by a grand jury. He was, however, tried and acquitted um, and later fired by the police department. So, so I'm reading about this story that I first encountered and it's now 40 years later. I'm giving away my age, so I'm 52. So it's 40 years later, 42 years later, um, I'm talking about a story like this. I'm talking about a story very like Tamir Rice. And I tell the story because I want people to understand that this is not a new phenomenon. So what is new? Well, um, having, you know, videos, really clear videos of what happened, um, you know, we see that the officer rolls up on Tamir Rice and shoots him in two seconds. This, it's not a dispute. It's not, it's not a he said, she said. That is what happened. So we know that to be true. Um, we have social media as a means of communicating. So I first found out about the killing of Mike Brown um, on Twitter. It was a Saturday. And I saw a tweet that said they just killed this um, man, this kid, his hands were up, um, you know, he was surrendering. About an hour later, I saw another tweet that said his body's still in the street, and an hour after that, his body's still in the street, and it was gathering more and more followers, and, um, and that's how, it, over the first four days, I engaged this issue as protests happened, as unrest began, because it wasn't until Tuesday that CNN covered the story. So there were a million tweets before the story was even covered by mainstream media. So there was a way of communicating about something uh, that didn't exist in the past. And that's important because our disconnection from one another has allowed so many stories, like the story of Clifford Glover, to be buried. Um, and the lack of you know, actual photos and videos have allowed for what I call kind of um, the gaslighting of the black community, which is something I found when I was writing about lynching also. The pretense that something that happened didn't happen. So I think that's part of the reason that we're able to accumulate the information that we've accumulated over the last year. But of course, that does not tell the whole story when you begin to add up the list. So here's the moment we're in. Ezell Ford in California, Tamir Rice in Ohio, John Crawford in Ohio, Mike Brown in Ferguson, Kajemi Powell in St. Louis, Akai Gurley uh, in New York, and that's just a few of them. And that doesn't even include the assaults. It doesn't include Marlene Pinnock beaten on the highway uh, in California. It doesn't, doesn't include LeVar Jones shot four times by a South Carolina officer as he's trying to retrieve his ID from his car. But in the case of the killings, we have the killings of maybe 10 people by law enforcement, unarmed. And to this moment, no one, no one has suffered any official consequences as a result. That's powerful. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with that moment? What does it say about the state of our democracy, as Dean Tobin said? And what do we need to do going forward to deal with um, this moment that we find ourselves in? And of course, this is now the business that I'm in, um, is trying to figure out what is the answer to that question. Um, and I think it's complicated. It's very, very complicated, um, but it's very necessary. And so out of this, incredibly difficult time period, incredibly difficult and challenging, most difficult and challenging, of course, for the families um, of these individuals and for uh, the communities where these events have happened. 
Um, but out of this has to come change. So how does change happen? Well, I'm focusing really on two levels. Um, one is kind of micro, although by micro I don't mean to diminish it because it's still very challenging. One is macro in that it is um, huge and structural, but I think critically important. And so I thought maybe I'd talk about both of those um, and then see where we are on time. So I call it micro, but it's big. Within a week after Mike Brown was killed, we wrote a letter, and of course we're lawyers, so when we say letter, we mean <laughs> manifesto. Um, we wrote a detailed, shall we say, letter to Attorney General Holder. Um, because we wanted to find a real solution. And what I believe is the problem is not only that we have you know, a problem in the culture of policing, which I think is absolutely true. Um, actually, let me just stop there and I'll talk about the second problem later. So a problem in the culture of policing, right? Um, there is something wrong in each of these encounters that you can look at and you say, well, why would, why would you react that way, right? Why would you, what, what do you think will be the result of an encounter in which you tell a teenager to get the F out of the street? I mean, right? So you just know where that's going. Um, you know, what, what happens when, when, when you roll up in a store where you think, let's say you even think a man has a gun, is carrying a gun in an open carry state, and you start shooting, right? So we've got some issues. What happens when you roll up on Kajemi Powell in St. Louis, and he has a knife, and you roll up, and he says, shoot me, and in 15 seconds, you shoot him? There's some problems. So the letter we wrote to the Attorney General tried to find how do we deal with this issue of the culture of, the, of policing. Now, culture is different than just practice, right? Culture is something that's deeply embedded. And culture is not something that you can change overnight. It has, it has to change over time. And I would argue, and you know, others may disagree with me, but I think that the culture of policing is particularly difficult to change because policing um, is a family profession in this country, right? You know, your dad was a police officer and your uncle was a police officer and your mom's a prosecutor and like it's, 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 it's embedded in the family. This is across race, by the way. So whatever happens on the job, whatever training you get on the job, you come home around the dinner table and your uncle says, well, this is how we really deal with it, right? And so you're, you're now talking about entering the family profession in which there is received knowledge. So we, said, we tried to figure out how do we deal with this culture, number one. Number two, we knew that if we went to the Department of Justice and suggested anything that involved legislation, they would say what is actually true, um, that our legislative system is broken, that Congress is not going to do anything, and we can't get anything done. And I'm just over that. So we um, decided that we were going to find a path that could be undertaken without Congress. Um, and the path we selected comes in some ways out of our own experience um, as civil rights litigators. So many of you know that our organization is a case that conceived and litigated and won Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. But many of you who are old enough also know that for that brief period in which there was a real project around integration happening in schools all over the country, particularly in the North, it didn't really begin until after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So why is that true? Well, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 contains Title VI. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, essentially said schools, school districts, you will not get funds from the federal government if you discriminate. And so that's how I got bused to school in New York in 1968. Um, so what that means is that while it's very important to have Supreme Court decisions, and while it's very important to change hearts and minds, money is a powerful incentive for change. So um, we began to look at the money streams. And essentially, we give about um, probably nearly a billion, but certainly more than half a billion dollars a year uh, in federal government money through grants to police jurisdictions all over this country. A lot of money. Um, and I'm not trying to stop the money. I think it should get the money. Um, I do, however, think 
that the money needs to now um, be contingent on some things. Um, many of those things are in the training area, and you've been hearing a lot about this. So training um, in implicit bias, and we could maybe talk about that more later. Training in de-escalation. How do you de-escalate an encounter rather than like turn it up? Um, training in encounters with the mentally ill, which is a really serious problem for those of you who are engaged in disability rights work. Um, so several levels of training needed. Whatever is happening now is not doing it, uh, and it needs to be better. Um, we included, you know, the use of body-worn cameras, um, and we included a whole set of requirements around data collection, which, you know, these are the kinds of things we have to think about as lawyers in terms of how you create incentives and change culture. You know, what you ask for, thank you, what you ask for um, in terms of the requirements of data tells people what your values are, right? So the federal government requires data from police departments all over the country about a whole variety of things, how many arrests and so forth. But there are a whole lot of other things that they don't ask about and that they should be asking about. And so we should be incentivizing other kinds of data collection. What is the diversity of your police force? How many civil rights complaints were filed against your officers and how were they resolved? Um, uh, you know, what, what incentives are in place for officers not unholstering their weapon rather than unholstering their weapon? What are the supervisory um, uh, mechanics and apparatus that's in place to reinforce training? Because at the end of the day, let me just, you're hearing the word training, 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 and I'm saying it a lot too, without the supervision, it does not work. And anybody who is in the workplace knows that. So there has to be real supervision, and then lastly, accountability. So how, what are the internal affairs um, protocols? How many people have been punished? All of those things are part of what we believe the federal government that hands out these you know, large sums of money to police departments should be requiring that police departments collect that information because we have a data problem. We can't even, I mean, I can go right online right now and tell you how many officers were feloniously killed last year and the year before and the year before that, but I could not tell you how many unarmed citizens were killed by police officers last year and the year before that. So we need data. So that, that's kind of been our short-term project. We met thereafter immediately with Attorney General Holder. I have shared this with the President. We have met with um, uh, staff in the Department of Justice and we're continuing to engage that issue. And I testified before the uh, President's Task Force on Policing about this issue and how to deal with it as well. So that's, I want to say short term, but not really short term, because of course that takes time and it is meant to change culture. It, it, it's meant over time to suggest what is appropriate behavior. It is meant to reward a certain kind of conduct. It is meant to institutionalize a certain kind of training. Uh, and I've even gone so far as to suggest that grants should be made for a longer period so that they span administrations because you don't want this program to end just because you have a new president, whoever that new president might be. So that's short term, um, even though it's also complex. The longer term problem, and this is probably what I have to end with, um, really goes back to the core work of the Legal Defense Fund. Um, I'm hoping that Brown versus Board of Education is still taught in con law, although I'm not sure. Um, but m many of you have read the opinion, and you know it's a short opinion. Um, and one of the most you know, important parts of it is the way in which it exposes the reality of segregation as a form of white supremacy, right? That it's not just like, you know, this is how people like it in the South and black people over here and white people over here. It, it is designed to subordinate black people. It doesn't say it quite in those words, but that's essentially what the decision reveals. And it also talks about the harm of segregation on, on black children and the way in which it sends messages about uh, self-worth and the worth of their communities and so forth. And, and so it's lovely. Um, but in fact, the brief that was submitted by the 30 social scientists, including Kenneth Clark, who did you know, the doll test that you've all heard about, but the 30 social scientists who worked on Brown, and the doll test, which is the smallest part of the work that they did, um, 
concluded something else. That brief, it was actually an appendix to our brief, talked about the harm of segregation on white children. Now that didn't make it into the Supreme Court's decision. I kind of get it. You know, it was a little bit of a negotiation to get the 9-0, 1954. I get it. But I think it's really important that we revisit it. And what those social scientists said was that segregation powerfully harms white children with a false sense of their own um, ability to achieve and also with feelings of guilt and um, an over um, kind of a very heavy sense of trust in authority even when, when not deserved. And that it also produces moral conflict because they hear the people in their community es espouse values about justice and equality as their conduct does quite the opposite. I mean, it's actually quite powerful. And I really believe we're living with the results of that. And I think we can no longer turn away from that reality. The reality is we cannot afford to live in a segregated society anymore. Now, we had a choice, LDF, in the late 1940s. We litigated the Shelley versus Kramer case, which, um, as you know, ended racially restrictive covenants. St. Louis, by the way. Um, and we had a choice at that point. Housing segregation, segregated education. We stuck with segregated education. And it was Thurgood Marshall's belief that when we finished um, segregated education, we would go right on to housing. And of course, the massive resistance to Brown ended up entangling us, right, in um, trying to deal with segregated education and trying to enforce Brown um, in ways that didn't, never allowed us to get powerfully back to the issue of housing segregation. But the truth is, housing segregation is kind of the meat and potatoes of the thing. If you, if, if you end housing segregation, you end education segregation. Um, and housing segregation is not about bad and evil white people who don't want to live to, next to black people. I mean, it's partly about that, right? Um, without question. But the reason why Baltimore looks the way it looks, or any other city you visited in America, is largely not because of that. It's largely because of the massive investments and the policy of the federal government that created in the 20th century a segregated society, certainly in the North. From 1934, when the federal government began to give mortgage insurance, to 1968, when the Fair Housing Act was passed, 98% of those mortgages went to white people. And for most of that period, racially restrictive covenants were required, were required in mortgages backed by the federal government. Public housing was segregated by race, was created, was built, was constructed as black public housing and white public housing. So we don't look like this by accident. It's not as though some people just wanted to live here and some people just wanted to live there. The entire landscape of our country, particularly our northern cities, was a project of the federal government through its policies and investments. It was the federal government that invested in the interstate highways that allowed all white suburbs to be created, places like Levittown and others. And it was the tax credits that we gave those developers and builders that allowed those places to be created. So what do we do in America when we've discovered we've been doing something really terrible and we feel really bad about it? We decide to stop doing it, which is a wonderful thing. The Fair Housing Act of 1968, Martin Luther King is assassinated that same week. We passed the Fair Housing Act as segregated cities all over this country are burning. And it's essentially an anti-segregation statute. But the truth is, you cannot have massive amounts of money and decades of investment and policy to create a segregated society and then just stop doing it and think you're going to get an integrated society. We have never, on the other side, created the policies or the investments that would undo what created this landscape that we all have inherited. And it is our belief that it is now time to return to that issue that we can no longer afford to continue to live separately, that the economic um, outlook and outcome for African Americans, like most Americans, continues to be connected to the access to housing. And so it affects the economic picture. It affects our knowledge of one another. 
It affects what we are able to tolerate and believe. If we think about all of the instances of policing and the relationship of police to communities, we can't afford it. And so our larger project is to return to that core issue and to begin to think through how to construct work that no doubt will take quite a bit of time that tries to go to that problem. We think it's worth it if it takes 20 years, if it takes 30 years, because I just told you about Clifford Glover, who was killed 42 years ago. So if what we do changes things for the grandchildren of students who are here, I will feel very satisfied. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So I would love to take questions or answers. <laughs> Not the Maryland I know. Where are the questions? Break the ice. So you mentioned that one of the prongs that you were talking to the Justice Department about and the President about was um, body cameras for police officers. Yes. How would you respond to um, people who say cameras don't make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't make a difference for Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they'll make a difference? How do you respond? So first of all, the Eric Eric Garner's case did not involve a police-worn body camera. Eric Garner's case involved a person on the street who had a cell phone up who took a video of the killing. Um, so body-worn cameras are meant to do several things. Now, don't get me wrong. If a police officer turns the body-worn camera off, obviously there is no difference. Um, but it's meant to do two things. One, it's meant to be a deterrent to the police officer. I mean, think about in your own day, if you knew you were wearing a camera, you'd do some things differently, come on, <laughs> right? So, so it is, it, it's not the same thing as a police officer. It, 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 it's not supposed to just be the um, gathering of investigative material for, after someone's already dead, right? It's supposed to um, incentivize, incentivize police officers to behave in a certain way. And that may just include the language that's used in, in engaging people. Um, and so when people say, you know, well, we saw, you know, Eric Garner killed, that wasn't a body one camera. That being said, there still has to be training around, you know, how that body one camera is used, how it's used in conjunction, conjunction with dash cams. It's not going to solve everything because, as you know, there's still going to be, um, you know, controversies around what really happened. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, the, the more interesting critique from my perspective has been people who've said that in the places where there are body-worn cameras and there are, they are dis disputes, that body-worn cameras tend to help police officers more than anything else. But, you know, if, if that's what it shakes out to be, that's what it shakes out to be. But if you look at places like Rialto, California, that did, has used body-worn cameras, it actually has not, not only has crime gone down, but the, um, you know, complaints against the police department have been reduced also. So we at least need a broader pilot program. Um, and we're going to learn, right? You're gonna, you, you know, we're going to use them in big cities, and we're going to discover that you know, there are certain kinds of issues, right? People who have concerns about privacy issues, I think those are really important about what happens to this material. People who have concerns about the fear that some people may have of talking to the police if police are wearing a camera. You know, Baltimore's kind of famous for that issue. So, so I mean, so I think, so I'm completely open to all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you're talking about a highly charged encounter in which we've got to have some information. Um, and, you know, I hear arguments all the time from police officers who say, you know, but what about, well, actually, why don't I just ask this question? People say, what about black on black crime? <laughs> you know, what about, um, what about, you know, people who behave badly out there? And I just think that the whole idea that, that we would put police officers on the same level as criminals is outrageous. Um, police officers are agents of the state to whom we have entrusted the power to take life. Not just to keep us safe, to take life, we give them a gun, we give them pepper spray, we give them a taser, we give them a shield. I mean, this is serious stuff. And at the end of the day, um, we deserve them when we don't give them the equipment that they need, and that equipment includes training. Equipment is not just like the vest, you know, and, 
and the car and the iPhone. Like I always hear about the equipment, equi the tangible equipment. But I mean the equipment to do the job well and to engage with the public. And part of this involves, by the way, um, being real about police officers' fears. So I also get impatient with people. What do, they have, what do they have to be afraid of? Now, I want to be clear. I, 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 I do think that there are exaggerated fears that have to be dealt with. And, and that was the matter I said I was putting off at the beginning that maybe I can return to, to now. And that's about kind of the narrative of young black men. So we get that in a second. But in terms of real fear, as we were in this whole issue in Ferguson in, in early September, Missouri passed a new um, gun law that allows, I think it allows like teachers and administrators to carry guns and lowered the concealed gun carry age uh, for a permit from 21 to 19. Go figure. So actually, you know, in many places, police officers do fear that every time they have an encounter, that person could be packing. That, that's real. So we, we actually have to factor that into how we engage this as well. We have to factor in when we do things like expose police to that, that we bear some responsibility for that fear. Um, so let me go back to the piece I was going to say about the narrative about black life, because this one is more difficult but really important. And it's one of the reasons why um, LDF is going to be engaged much more in research and um, strategic communications, because I do think that while I get impatient with, you know, constant calls for conversations about race because we're having them all the time. It's not, it's not like something you get invited to and it's at M&T Bank Stadium or, you know, it's, we're doing it, we, we do it, most of us do it a lot, right? Um, even when we purport to be talking about, you know, taxes and urban problems and um, all kinds of other things. Um, but one of the reasons why LDF is going to get more into this kind of strategic communications work, and we, we're going to be launching this year something called the Thurgood Marshall Institute. It's going to be a kind of research and policy arm of LDF embedded within LDF, um, is because the debate about civil rights and race is really important to um, our ability to move in this democracy past, past some of the issues that have really held us back. And as lawyers, I think it's important for you all to know that even as, as litigators, um, particularly in the civil rights space, the zeitgeist, the conversation that is happening in the country is not irrelevant. I mean, I'm sure by now you know this, right? I, most, you know, many judges are not even pretending anymore that they're not influenced by the zeitgeist. But they, if you look at the marriage equality cases over the last few years, where essentially the court's saying, well, we just wait, let's see what happens. I mean, they're saying, we want to see what happens in the states, but really they're saying, let's see, <laughs> you know, um, because we don't want to get out ahead of the public, right? So um, one of the LDF's great successes was that we and um, many other organizations and individuals who are in the civil rights movement created a conversation about race that certainly I grew up with and that you know, now you all maybe are having the, em the embers of that fire, right? It was about what equality is, it was about justice, um, and, uh, and that's very important. But no narrative lasts forever. You have to refurbish the narrative. And if there's a mistake that those of us who do civil rights work have made is that we've been living on the same narrative with people who weren't even born anytime you know, near the civil rights movement and who have really no connection to that story beyond as a kind of sepia-toned you know, historical narrative. So um, we really think it's important to re-engage that work because right now, part of what we have to deal with is not just that Akai Gurley was killed by accident in the public housing stairway, but that the officer who killed him by accident didn't run down the stairs and start administering CPR, but started instead texting his union. It isn't just that Tamir Rice was killed within two seconds standing in a public park um, with a toy gun. It's that when his sister screamed, oh my God, you killed my baby brother, they tackled his 14-year-old sister and handcuffed her and put her in the police car and told the mother, if you don't stop screaming, we'll handcuff you too. It's about the value assigned to black life, which is why the Black Lives Matter movement is so important, because you shouldn't have to say it, but you do have to say it. It isn't just about the person that they killed. I told you about the tweets that I was reading. It was about Mike Brown's body lying in the street for four hours. It was about the disrespect afforded to the grief of the family. And so that's why I'm glad there are lawyers and social work students here, because there is an Im important emotional component to this that we have to deal with. 
And so what resonates then in the community is not just the killing, it's how that family is treated. It's how that community is treated. It's the way in which we are regarded as not having love for our children. So we have to begin to grapple with that too. What is this narrative about who young black men are? Why is it that the, the, the uh, social scientists and the psychologists now tell us that they can demonstrate that um, officers, police officers very often, um, but whites across the board will add five years to the age of a young African-American man in guessing his age. So that the 15-year-old looks like a 20-year-old. I mean, the, the, the police officer who shot Tamir Rice said he, he's 20. Right? So what's that about? What, what, is, it, what is it about um, Officer Wilson? You know, how is it credible to a grand jury when an officer says, I felt like a five-year-old compared to this black teenager? I get that you know, that Mike Brown is 6'4 and 320, but, you know, Darren Wilson was 6'1 and 240, and he was in a car with a gun. I felt like a five-year-old compared to him? What is that? Right? And, and, and moreover, it's not just him saying it. It's that it sounds credible in the ears of a grand jury. Right? That he bulked up and looked like he was going to run through the bullets. What's that? Right? But that only can exist as, a actual, as actual testimony, and as testimony that is received and credited if you already have this idea in your head about who a man like Mike Brown is with this scary big teenager, or, or um, who Tamir Rice is standing at that park, or who his sister is when she's grieving and crying. And so we also have to deal with that piece. And we can pretend that as lawyers that's somebody else's problem, but you're not going to win any cases unless you deal with that because you're going to have a jury of people and judges who are people who are just as subject to those narratives as those grand jurors were in Ferguson. And so we really see this moment as a kind of opening up of the work, as being about work that is in some ways kind of strictly legal, but that really engages the narrative about race in this country. Uh. Hi, my name is Fernando Kirkman. Uh, thanks for coming back. I've heard a lot of great things about you from the 3L class, so uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, my question was kind of about what you were just talking about, uh, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, um, but while I agree with some of the issues about training and structural issues, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious what laws or training can we provide to kind of overcome the embedded fear, which at least to me leads to almost a fungibility of black lives. And I, and, I, and I use that word fungibility as opposed to matters because I think that we kind of agree that, like, no one's going to really say black lives don't matter, but it seems like there's this level of fungibility that I saw debated after, like, the shooting, which was kind of like, well, and he was, he was black, but he was in college. He was headed to college versus, like, you know, oh, but he had a criminal record and he was, you know, not, the, not this, you know, great college student. And so for me, it was kind of unsettling watching that debate play out because it was like, why are we even having a discussion of like whether this person's life is expendable or not based on like what he contributed or didn't contribute uh, to society? So how, how can laws or, or training mm -hmm. impact that? That's a terrific question. That, and that goes precisely to the point I was just raising, which kind of really wasn't about training, but was about kind of changing this narrative. The first thing we have to do is we have to not participate in that. Um, now, some of this is attributable to grief, which is understandable, right? So Mike Brown was killed and people began to say he was a gentle giant and, you know, and you lose someone that you love and you remember the wonderful things about them and you say it and you want to speak that into, into the air because that person is gone and we shouldn't be stopping people from doing that. However, the other side to that is you begin to suggest that the um, uh, angelic qualities of the person, right, is what made their life valuable. So the first thing we do is we have to stop our participation in that. Because I absolutely agree with you. I think that's a great point. Um, but, then, but then secondly, I think this idea that someone is killed and we immediately go to let's find out more about them as a victim is kind of astonishing. I mean, I will really credit Commissioner Bratton in New York that when Akai Gurley was killed in that public housing stairway that night, Bratton's words were, he was a total innocent. He didn't know anything about Akai Gurley's background. He was just saying he didn't do anything to get shot. Right? He got shot by this officer, whether it's by accident or otherwise. And, I, and that was really important to me, that Bratton said that. He didn't say, let's find out whether he was on PCP. He didn't say, let's find out whether he had ever been arrested. He just said, he's a total innocent. Um, and so we need that kind of leadership, really. 
um, from, from police officers and others. This is an issue of the media, too, which immediately begins to probe the life of a victim. Um, and not every victim, because um, the two officers who were tragically killed in New York, the media wasn't like going into their background to find out like their records. They were, they were recognized as true victims, right? And yet when um, you know, these children are killed, look at what happened to Trayvon Martin. It, and he wasn't killed by a police officer, he was killed by somebody who was deluded into thinking maybe he was a police officer, but you know, it was, it was you know, what happened to him in school and what was he suspended for, and I mean, it's just, so no, I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily the training, because that is attributable to so many different parts of society. That's about the narrative I'm talking about, about how do we, um, the, the process, the long process of assigning humanity to another human being, which sounds like a no-brainer, but given our awful history of race in this country actually remains troubling for too many people. Um, I referenced before the book I wrote about lynching, I wrote the book because I wanted to understand what, does it, what happens that allows someone to participate in something that otherwise utterly repugnant. And, and not like a, a clans, clansman, but like a housewife. Or the guy who owned the, you know, the corner grocery store. So I, I'm very um, engaged with precisely the question that, that you're asking. And I think the answer is, it spreads across multiple disciplines, but is the one that I think we have to engage. So I know some of you have uh, class. So um, for those of you who have class, sorry, but I think we're going to try to go for about 10 more minutes and take just a couple more questions. Uh, Sherilyn, I think you have that much time? I do. OK. And thank you for coming. <clears throat> so thank you. Um, Nadine Finnegan Carr, I'm actually in the School of Social Work, mm -hmm. and I do follow you on Twitter. I'm <laughs> at Dr. Nay, AKA, so you've probably seen my tweets as well. Uh, one of the things, I truly agree with you that housing is the next way to go, and dismantling the policies that have such an effect on the systemic racism that occurs in America as a result of that segregation. My uh, comment to you is as you move forward with that, to really, truly keep social work and public health psychologists keep us all engaged because we have programs such as Moving to Opportunity and others which have demonstrated that moving, just moving our people into different situations can sometimes be detrimental to our young black men as well. Um, so as you move forward, just making sure that we don't cause more harm than good mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm will be necessary in order for us to achieve success for the grandchildren of our students in 20, 30 years. That's terrific. Um, could not agree with you more. And it's one of the reasons why when we, because we participated in the Baltimore public housing case, um, that we wanted, you know, we, we'd seen the earlier studies about what some of the challenges were uh, and embedded into this process more support to deal with precisely the issue that you're talking about. Um, and of course, you know, I'm imagining Yes, it's, it's moving people to communities of opportunity to, to get out of kind of the distress, but I'm also interested in making more communities communities of opportunity and creating incentives for the movement to go the other way, um, which, you know, in terms of segregated education never happened, right? It, it, you know, I, I was bused, but, you know, white students were not bused to come to schools in my neighborhood. So, so it's figuring out how to put those two pieces together, and as I suggested, it's going to be not only about policy, but it's going to be about investment. It's going to be about money. And when I say that, people say, whoa, what are you talking about? You know, we invest in things all the time. It's not that we don't have money. We invest all the time. You know, we, we, we invested, you know, in, in, in mental health, uh, and it's called mass incarceration, right? So, we, we, you know, we find the money. We, we figure it out. We decide we're going to have war on drugs. We decide to just have it. Um, and we did it. So we, we have to have the will to have investments to make uh, this change for, you know, for our future. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Michael Reich. I'm on the faculty at the School of Social Work. I have two questions. Sure. The first has to do with the legal aspect of mm -hmm. your argument. Yeah. Given the growing power of federalism mm -hmm. in our system right now mm -hmm. and the unwillingness of many states, whether it's at the legislative or the judicial level, to implement policies to promote social equality, 
what do you see as the likelihood of your success? Because Brown was argued in stages, as you well know, in an environment in which the courts, at least, were more receptive to these kind of arguments than they seem to be now, particularly at the Supreme Court level. Yeah. My second question is a kind of a response to what you said about culture. Um, this morning in the New York Times, Charles Blow had an op-ed in which he pointed out through uh, polling data the huge disparity in the attitudes among the white and the African American community about whether police can be trusted and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. How can training of police alone mm -hmm. affect that huge gap in credibility mm -hmm. that this poll just demonstrated? So yeah. really two questions, one great. about the law, the yeah. legal system, and the other about the culture two, of our society. Two great questions. The, the first question um, is about political reality, right, and, and legal reality also in terms of the court. Um, I'm actually quite comforted by the uh, arc of Brown, um, which is not, um, you know, an arc of consistent success. So, you know, as we all know, Brown really begins here, right, in 1935 with the case challenging uh, segregation at University of Maryland Law School. That case was won in municipal court in Baltimore City not a federal court case. Um, then they went to Missouri, then they went to Texas and so forth. And in between, they lost a lot of cases, you know, the equal pay cases and so, you know, and trying to build a school, black high school in Baltimore County, lost that one, right? So, so it's not an unbroken line of success, number one. Number two, it was the willingness to start small where you could win, like in Baltimore City Municipal Court, um, and to work it through the system. And it took 20 years before it got to the Supreme Court. And when it got to the Supreme Court, it was not a clear win. I mean, if Chief Justice Vincent doesn't have a heart attack, which resulted in the appointment of Earl Warren as Chief Justice, I'm not really sure how it goes. I'm certainly not sure that it's unanimous. Um, so I just, you know, I, because I, uh, again, I heard the introduction all about Thurgood Marshall, you know, like no pressure for me, right? So, <laughs> um, so but, I, but I take great comfort in that, that, that walk, you know, you go where you can win, right? You begin to build the block small. So for us as a uh, strategic matter within LDF, it means looking at states where, you, you know, where things are per perhaps more hospitable to do some experimentation. You know, it means it's the process of building law and, and building law from the bottom up, not just that, you know, my, my job right now, to be perfectly honest, is I'm not really interested in having any case before this particular Supreme Court at this moment that, you know, it's, it, I mean, there are some there, but it's not because I wanted them there. So, um, so frankly, this is the time to incubate and to uh, workshop, right? Because at some point there will be a more hospitable Supreme Court. My greatest fear is that when there is, I won't have anything ready that I've worked through the system. So that's, that's how I kind of see that. The, the, the challenge though, um, which is where I thought you were going with this is, you know, I said before that like money is an incentive and actually when I'm watching the healthcare piece and the, you know, Medicaid spend, how many states have refused, it's kind of scary, right? So I'm a little, I don't have an answer to that one um, because that's quite troubling and particularly when I'm talking about housing because housing really involves federal dollars Right, and if people are saying no, 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 I'd rather not have a highway. No thanks, but no thanks on the on the train or on the new housing or you know that that is uh, daunting. I haven't figured that one out. The second piece about the credibility gap. Um, Commissioner Bratton said the other day, I don't know why I'm quoting him so much. People would be shocked to hear this, but um, <laughs> said, I believe that if we embrace our communities, they will embrace us back. That's what the police commissioner of New York said, and I actually believe that's true. In the, in the sense that first move is the police. Um, we just, uh, at the point of settling a case with the um, NYPD, um, it's kind of an analog to the stop and frisk cases, but it's in public housing. It's about trespass arrest, arrests. And we, so we talk about this a lot because we do need to also educate public housing residents and create opportunities for public housing residents to think about how they engage with the police as well. It's a two-way street, right? But it's also clear that the first step has to come from the people who have all the power. They have the power. It's like you, you know, in, in, in your class, 
um, you, don't, you, know, you don't go into your classroom and say, well, first I'm waiting to see what the students are going to give me, right? You, you come in, you're prepared. You have a syllabus. You have um, rules of engagement. You show the students that you're fair and that you'll call on all kinds of people. You do that. And in return, they give you their engagement. And I think this is how it has to be um, with the police also, that we need to see some steps and some movement. And then I, I do believe that we have to require that the community be responsive to that, be responsive to the good faith effort, efforts of police departments and police officers to, to engage with the community. And that's going to require communication and conversation. That's not going to just be about the training. That's going to be about um, devoting real time and dollars to creating relationships between um, police and the communities, which are quite damaged. And so we will have to be patient as well, because you can't expect on a dime that, you know, now the police officer says, hi, I'm police officer Joe, you know, trust me, I, I'm here to do community policing. That's just not going to work that way. Um, and that's why I said we have to get started on this now, because it is going to take time. Well, thank you so, so much for... Thank you so much for joining us, and what, what an honor and privilege is, it is to be able to call you my, my colleague, and thank you so much for, for coming and helping us think through these, these really important issues, and maybe not what beyond is what we need to do today. So, so thank you again, and thank you all for coming. Uh,